we go through these hypotheticals with the board, call them disaster recovery scenarios. And you talk about a hypothetical act of God weather event, or you talk about infrastructure failure, or you talk about a challenge perhaps with a, a pandemic or something like that. And in fact, in my time here, we've dealt with all of those at IFS in Sri Lanka, but it's been okay. So there's lots of things that we do to mitigate the impact. But at the end of the day, it comes back to that passion and enthusiasm and commitment that our employees have got. Because when things are tough, it's hard to motivate yourself to get up and work and, and do your job. But they do. When you engage with the team here, you see their passion and energy and enthusiasm. And frankly, that's why we continue to invest here. Five years as CEO have been great. And I think whenever you take on a new role, there are always uh, pros and cons. There are things that uh, you know you were happy to find and things that maybe were not so good to find. But you know, I think having done five years as CEO at IFS, one of the things that has really, really proven to be a, a gem in, in, in the, the, the crown of IFS has been our operation in Sri Lanka. And from the beginning, when I joined in 2018, it was immediately apparent that that was the case. I came out, um, for two visits in that first year that I was there and it was immediately apparent that there was this great wealth of talent of really passionate enthusiastic people who loved what they did who had a, a natural aptitude to you know providing you know a, a really customer centric customer focused uh, quality of work so uh, yeah you know I love Sri Lanka I love what we do here um, and uh, the Sri Lankan operation is an incredibly important part of our IFS business. I think whenever I think about the, the challenges that we've had uh, in Sri Lanka, and to be honest, I think it would be, um, you have to talk about COVID and the, 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 the crisis that came after COVID, because I think COVID was such a big part of it. The reality is, is that both the impact of COVID as well as the impact of, of the kind of ensuing um, financial crisis and, and, and social political unrest has really just proven the resilience of, of the operation that we have in Sri Lanka. Um, and that's a, you know, it's, it is honestly a testament to the people. Um, you know, political unrest and, and social unrest and financial uh, complexity, upheaval. Um, you know, it, it, not every country deals with it particularly well, but the operation here has. And, you know, while it has absolutely at times been a cause for concern and as a, as a global business with the investment that we have in Sri Lankan, it, it, it's normal for us to be concerned it has never proven to be an issue and we've managed to um, you know, continue to provide a very reliable and, and, and consistent quality of, of, of capability out of Sri Lanka. Um, what we have done as a global business is that we have built more resiliency in, in other centers. So we, you know, we have more fallback options in terms of our operation in India, our operation in near shore in, in Canada and so on. Um, but we, you know, we remain focused on our investments in Sri Lanka. And, you know, it's, as, as someone who is very close to what's happening, it's great to be here again and, and you know, see people carrying on around their normal lives and seeing um, inflation coming back under control and seeing that trend of improvement um, and just seeing things coming back on track. You know, it's great to see. We go through these hypotheticals with the board, call them disaster recovery scenarios. And you talk about a hypothetical um, act of God weather event, or you talk about infrastructure failure, or you talk about a challenge perhaps with a, a pandemic or something like that. And in fact, in my time here, we've dealt with all of those at IFS uh, in Sri Lanka, but it's been okay. And, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we obviously have plans in place so that people can work from home, that they have broadband at home, uh, that they can do their jobs from home and all of the, the infrastructure and capability that needs to go in there. We have generators in the office in case there's power failures, you know, all of the stuff that needs to have, we have multiple locations. So there's lots of things that we do to mitigate the impact. But at the end of the day, um, it comes back to that passion and enthusiasm and commitment that our employees have got. Because when things are tough, it's hard to motivate yourself to get up and work and, and do your job, but they do. Um, and you know, when you engage with the team here, you see their passion and energy and enthusiasm. And frankly, that's why we continue to invest here because we have other options. But when you have great employees and you have great uh, passionate colleagues who are passionate about the customers and the work that they do, then why go somewhere else? The global talent pool um, 
has been challenging for the last couple of years, right? We all know about this, the, the, the term of the great resignation, which was something that we faced in all of our markets throughout 2021 and into 2022. And look, it was the same in Sri Lanka. And obviously, when you have great talent um, and there is um, kind of socio-economic challenges, then they're going to look for somewhere where they can go and work that is more stable. So attrition has been higher in 2022 than what we saw in prior years, but it was higher everywhere in the world than what we'd seen in prior years. Um, we see it starting to stabilize now. Um, and I think, you know, my commitment to our employees is that we are deeply invested in Sri Lanka. We're deeply committed to them. Um, we are committed to giving them job security and providing them with a level of job security that maybe is not common in today's market because we see some of the biggest software companies in the world, you know, the Amazons and the Googles and so on, laying people off and we're not laying people off. So, you know, there's got to be value in that stability. And I think that, you know, there's a lot to be enthusiastic about now. We start to see the new governments obviously have, have, have got a handle on the situation. We see some stability coming back in. Uh, I'm here now and people are out in the restaurants and everything's, uh, you know, returning to normal. Uh, and that's great to see. You know, I think it's it, there's a lot to be positive about. And uh, my message to our employees are that we will continue to grow. We will continue to create opportunities for them here in this market. Um, and I hope that they stay committed to the country because, you know, the, the, it's a beautiful country and, and uh, the grass is not greener on the other side. From a, a technology perspective and from the products that we deliver, um, that continues to evolve. We've made a big leap over the last few years, the launch a couple of years ago now of IFS Cloud. So this is where our IFS application is provided in the cloud, natively in the cloud, you know, both for local customers and for global customers. This is a big step because if you think about where customers used to be, where they would deploy on-premise, their business models would change, there would be innovation, um, but the technology stood still because it was on-premise and it was delivered in their environment. What would happen over time is their business would change, there would be new requirements, and then they would have to do a big upgrade. That upgrade would be very time consuming, it would be very expensive, and then they would potentially get some new innovation, and then they would go into this period of two or three or four years in which there was no innovation again. And what the cloud has done is it's brought a, a new dimension there where customers are on an application that is constantly changing and it is constantly being updated. And that means that whether their business model is changing or whether they have you know, new requirements in the business, new processes that need to be supported, the application can be updated on a continuous basis um, and we're always infusing the application with new capability. So they're getting the latest and greatest, you know, artificial intelligence and augmented reality uh, in the application, whatever the new technology is, available for them to use. Um, so that's the big change that we've seen. There's a lot of talk around the way in which artificial intelligence is going to impact uh, workers in general. And I think that, you know, there's little um, debate or argument around the fact that there are absolutely some roles um, that will become redundant as artificial intelligence takes over. If we see the impact the market has had on something like ChatGPT or, or Lambda now uh, in a very short space of time, and you start to see, you know, some of the, the, the obvious roles, you know, write me a contract, write me uh, a piece of creative writing, and, and, and this AI is doing that. And I think that the full power of that capability is still to be you know, understood. Um, but I'm a big believer that you know, artificial intelligence can only mirror what humans have taught it. It learns from what we teach them. And at the end of the day, this is about us continuing to innovate. So I'm confident that you know, some of the capability that is currently, requirement that is currently being fulfilled by humans, uh, AI will take that over but there will be new stuff. We'll free up human capacity to do jobs that only humans can do. And I'm a huge believer in that. And I think that um, that means that, you know, if, if you talk to my employees, there's a bunch of them that do very mundane tasks at the moment. And if we had to say to them, we can have, uh, you know, computers or AI to do the task, that, the mundane task that you're doing so that you can go and do something that's more interesting, that, that requires your unique talents. The point that the motor car came out, the horse-drawn carriage became largely redundant. Um, but that didn't mean that we took a step back, it meant that we took a step forward. 
And I think that for, for all of humanity, it, it is going to be a step forward. Um, and I think that it's about how do we harness it? How do we, how do we bring this capability to our customers? There's no point in pushing back on it because this is a, a tide that you will not stop. Um, and I think it's about embracing the capability and looking at how we harness it in order to make our lives better. You know, if there's one thing that, that uh, is a reality is, is that the pace of change is, is constant now um, and it's accelerating, right? So, so things have, have never ever in the history of time moved as fast as they are now. And they, again, they're only moving faster. Um, and I think that um, one thing that you see is that if, if nothing else, human beings are incredibly adaptable um, and, and we naturally do adapt to that change. Um, and I think that, um, you know, technology helps us in, in lots of different ways. If we think about the ways that we leverage technology to train and enable people today, uh, let me give you just a small example. When, when we started writing IFS uh, applications in the early days, we, we would require full stack developers, people who, who understood a programming language and they would have to write that application um, and we would have to evolve that application to be usable. Um, and today we use a declarative language so that it's much more modular and much more intuitive and you, there's, there's a lot more kind of business analysis skill involved rather than full coding capability. And that's a way in which technology has evolved. And that means that we can write applications much faster um, and they're much more intuitive to use. We didn't have that capability before, but people change, people adapt and, and they move forward uh, for the better. I think when you think about the, the kind of macroeconomic turmoil that we see at the moment, um, my view is it is an opportunity for us. Um, I think that uh, there's a bunch of research that's been done um, that shows that it, when there is a crisis like this, there is a very small percentage, but there is a percentage of companies that actually do even better. And I believe the reason for that is, is that the, the, the rest are defocused. Um, they become very internally focused. They become focused on, on um, you know, their own internal metrics. And our mission is to stay focused on our customers. How do we remain focused on what our customers want from us, where they're headed? How do we ensure that we're creating value for those customers and that we're doing the things that those customers need us to do, rather than worrying about what's happening internally in IFS? So from my perspective, we see this crisis as an opportunity. We see it as an opportunity to accelerate our, our gaining of market share um, and really to embed ourselves as the dominant leader in the space that we're in. Um, and that is that if there is a customer that is sitting with a, a lot of assets or service and they're looking at a solution that is going to help them to leverage those assets to be more efficient or how they service those assets. So it might be a telco, it might be a utility, uh, it might be an oil and gas company, it might be a defense uh, company, it might be a manufacturer. If they're in those industries and they're thinking about efficiency and productivity, that they think, you know what, IFS is, is the only vendor that we can go to. And we really are. We are the best positioned uh, to provide solutions in that space because we have an application that was purpose-built to do that. So we see this crisis as an opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, it is an opportunity because all every industry, every customer, when things get tougher, they have to find ways to do things better. Um, and that's fundamentally what our applications do. The challenge that, 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 um, that we have in Sri Lanka, or that you have in Sri Lanka, is coming from, from the old to the new, there's a tremendous amount to be done. Um, and I think that um, that transition is, is always difficult. Um, and when you've had the kind of challenge that you have over the last few years, um, that certainly makes it much harder. So I think that there are a, a few things. One is, is that you have to move the economy from being, uh, you know, what it was before, garments and, and, and natural resources, to being much more digital. And, and that fundamentally is a, is a difficult hurdle when you don't have the scale of perhaps uh, an India. So you're not necessarily gonna get the same size of companies coming here because if they need 20,000 developers, they're gonna struggle to find that here, um, especially if it becomes competitive. So I think that the, the, the challenge for Sri Lanka and it's something that I believe we are in the process of doing here is to be able to differentiate. You've got to be able to, to, uh, to, to differentiate yourself versus other, you know, other offshore locations. Um, and I think that the talent and the resilience of the people, I think is, a, is, is definitely a unique selling proposition. I think that is a, a, a quality uh, that you need to exploit. 
Um, I'd like it that you didn't do too good a job of that because I don't want too much competition for my resource. And I think we can grow quite nicely here. Uh, but on a serious note, I think that's the challenge is that you have a country that, that itself needs to digitize. Um, and, and there is a lot of scope for that. You know, I think on, on, on the way in here today, I was driving past the government departments and it's, you know, the buildings and it's very clear that they're not digital yet. Um, and so so the, the country needs to digitize from, from the inside out. Um, and, and I think that there is this, this challenge with scale. So we need to find the angle, uh, you know, if I was responsible for building this from, from a ministry perspective, we need to find that angle for how do we get people to recognize that we're not competing with India. We have a different value proposition and that value proposition needs to be around a higher level of skill and, and, and capability.